Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. I am a storyboard artist for animation and an illustrator. And today we're going to do a very quick painting. Um, well, I talk about just odd things in general. Um, this particular piece uh, is a dragon I did for the heck of it. And we're going to be using... Oh, thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to shake the camera. Um, basically, we're going to be using a zero and a number one um, sable watercolor brushes. You can tell these are beaten a little bit. Um, one's a Winsor Newton, one's a, um, um, let's see, a Cosmos. Um, they're both Kalinsky sable. Um, I definitely go for Kalinsky sable over any other kind of uh, um, watercolor brush just because um, I can beat them to death. I am brutal on my brushes and I beat them to death. What we're going to do here today first is I'm going to start out with a brown or red brown. This is a red and this is a burnt sienna. One's, um, this is an old Cotman um, watercolor kit. It's a traveling kit. You can get them um, today on just about um, any good art supply store will carry it again as a Winsor Newton Cotman watercolor set. So this is like their mid-range quality of watercolor. It's not their professional uh, level. It's not their lowest level. It's kind of in between. And I like this because it, actually right now because it's really easy to show you um, watercolor painting on a small video camera with the watercolor. And what I'm going to do, I'm basically tinting my uh, painting um, in the shadows primarily with um, the brown so and anything that that's going to be um, I'm thinking about the uh, the uh, shadow coming or the light coming from the top probably a little bit from this direction and down and so what I'm doing is, is I'm putting in a um, an antiquing it almost this is for the underpainting um, and this is, I'm not being, you can tell, I'm not being real um, careful at where I put uh, the shadows. This is more of a, a dabbling. And what it's going to do is it's going to stain the underpainting. It's going to give some volume to whatever color I decide to put on top of it. And it's, it gives it a, a nice antique feel, and it also gives a warmth to the watercolor painting. When you, you can use just about anything... Um, as an underpainting, you could use blue, you could use purple, um, I would use a darker color. I personally like to use a red-brown when I'm doing this technique. Um, it just, like I said, it gives a warmth to it, and especially um, if I'm going to use this dragon, I'm thinking I'm going to probably set in um, maybe greens and purples. I like green dragons. Um, dragons can come in any color you want them to be. Um, they come from all over the world. This particular dragon is more of a western style dragon than an eastern style dragon. Eastern style dragons have a tendency to have a horse-like head and serpentine bodies with fur, whereas western dragons have a tendency to be more snake-like and lizard-like and have wings. Um, even though you can, Eastern dragons can have wings. If they're very old dragons, they can have wings. They usually don't. They can fly without wings. Um, if you wanted to go into the biology of dragons, a lot of people have come up with odd biology for dragons that, you know, let's face it, they're not real. Um, when you think about it though, if you were a uh, European and you saw crocodiles in the, uh, the Nile River for the first time, you sure would think that they were dragons. And so the legends of dragons come from a lot of interesting and odd places. And of course, you know, snakes would always get, you have vipers all throughout Europe. So you would get all kinds of legends of dragons through that. But I'm basically just going to give this, uh, the um, underpainting on the dragon and not in the background as much. I'm going to keep the warmth on him this time around. And uh, so once we get done with this, 
I'm going to just let it sit while I do the background. Now when you're doing watercolor, it's good to paint all over the painting while you're working on it um, because various areas will be dry and various areas will be wet. So you kind of have to, to work around the wet areas and um, play with the dry areas more. Um, and it, again, it all depends on what type of technique you're using. My technique tends to be what um, I call wet on dry because the paper will be dry. You'll notice I did not wet the paper before I started painting with the watercolor. So I have a tendency to use a, a wet paint on dry paper technique more often than not. And then I'll go back and forth. Sometimes when I'm working, I will um, paint into wet areas to get various um, um, types of uh, um, uh, effects and sometimes too what, what I'll I haven't done it in a while um, show you what you can do with bleach and salt and other chemicals that while you're painting if you add to the watercolor you can get some really interesting effects out of it we're basically just about done with my my shadowing the dragon here and we're going to let that dry a bit. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play with the background. Um, we want, I want to have a sky back there. And I already have some, okay, you can tell my blue is kind of dirty here. I've got been mixing up, and this is a like a cobalt blue, this is a Prussian blue. And I've mixed in some purple and some grays in there. And so um, I like to mix up um, a little bit of everything. I like to actually use a dirty palette because a lot of times when I, I've mixed my last painting, there'll be some interesting colors already left on the palette, and then I'll utilize those colors in the next painting by just um, um, just mixing up what is ever there on the palette. So I don't always clean off my palette. It's a combination of I'm lazy. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest with you, I'm a bit lazy but also because I just find interesting colors that way. Um, because your, your color is straight off the, the cube of the, um, your watercolor um, pan um, is usually a little bit, I find a little too intense. And I wanted, I, I, I like to dull down my colors a bit anyways. It makes them feel a little bit less artificial. So I often do that. And, uh, Right now what we're doing is we're just using um, kind of, a, this is a little bit of a combination of Prussian blue and cobalt. And I'm going to take some of this is cobalt blue here, and I'll just add in, and you'll see that the cobalt ha it leans a little bit to the red or purple side. And uh, I'll mix up my blues where, with your, your um, more, uh, Prussian blue is more of like a turquoise and it leans to the green side and cobalt is more purple and will le lean to the red side or the cool side. So the thing is is that when you mix those two together, together and they run into each other they have a combination of you know one, the cool going into the warm will gray it down a bit um, and make it less intense or it'll have a blending of that going from green to red or, or that um, green to purple quality. So the, the blending of the two blues gives them a little bit um, more interesting feel. And um, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll lay down um, blues and purples together and just let them run into each other. Again, that, that way is called wet into wet and that will again make um, they'll come up with their own colors while they're drying so the thing is is that you're not controlling the color that much when you do a wet into wet situation the colors are kind of controlling themselves and you'll get a wide variety of color and I know that sometimes that's one of the reasons why a lot of people have troubles with watercolor because they can't control it entirely themselves and that um, sometimes runs into uh, difficulties when people are using it and I know that that um, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people will stay away from watercolor because um, it can be a little bit difficult to control 
And sometimes that's what you want from watercolor. You don't want to be able to control it. You want to let it do its own thing. Now you can see right here, I let some of that brown run into the sky. So what I'm doing is, as I scumble, when, I, when you're rubbing your brush like this, I call it scumbling. And what it does is that it has taken away that brown, has now mixed into the blue. So you're getting a little bit of a, a green quality there. But what it also did, it changed the edge so that it didn't look like you ran, or it doesn't look like I ran over the edge. Now you see right here, we got a little bit of foxing going on where one color has met the other. Or this area right here is a little bit wetter than this area up here. So I'm going to take a little bit of the wet into the dry, and I'll change that texture so that that foxing is not as pronounced, even though it will be, you can tell, will still have some little bit of graininess. There'll still be a little bit of odd edging. But by my, my shifting the, um, the watercolor around while it's drying, it'll change that edge to what I want more than the odd edge that the paint's creating. Now I'm, I'm mixing a little bit more cobalt into that kind of blue-gray. And I'm just throwing it into the sky here. And I'm just going to fill up the entire sky with a variety of the cool and the warm gray. Because when you have a, a blue, sorry, um, the cool and warm blue, when you've got a um, purpley blue that's considered cool and a green blue is considered warm because it's like to get a turquoise color, you're throwing yellow into it. And like right here was a little bit too light, so I'm going to throw a little bit more of that darker cobalt into it. So that it gets a little bit lighter. And the the the, um, the squiggly areas that I drew in there, I don't think I'm going to leave those white. We're going to see. Um, I'm I'm debating right now. And this is why when you're when you're painting something like this, you're making your decisions as you go along. And notice too when this this dries, sometimes see these white areas here and along the le leg here. I painted it up to that line when. I first painted it, but now the the um, the water is kind of cloyed back. The water has a cohesion quality to it. It it pulls like in a bubble, and what you can paint right up to an edge sometimes, but as it dries, it will pull backwards so that where you had left, you know, you didn't leave a line, you didn't leave a white space there, but the watercolor is pulling back from the paper and it'll leave a white space where you didn't intend to. And you can always fix that by going in with a, a little bit of a wet brush, or like, see, we've got a, a full-on edge going on here. And I don't want, yeah, I don't really want that edge there. So I'm gonna scumble it away a bit and add some more paint. And then that edge that dried there disappears. So while, when before the paint's like totally dried, it's much easier to get those edges then after the fact. And again, with most watercolor, it will always, almost always, dry a bit lighter than when it's wet. When it's wet, it'll be very dark. And then as it dries, it gets lighter. So you can see this area in here um, is very light. And go in there a little bit with some more. And even then, when it dries again, it'll still be lighter when it dries. Also, another problem with blues, just in general, when you're scanning them into your computer. Because most of the time, what you're going to want to do when you get done with a piece like this, um, you'll scan it into your computer, you can augment it in your computer, you can add... Um, um, it's nice to do a base painting like this. If you have Photoshop or you have um, Quick Studio Paint or any type of um, digital painting program, um, you can take a watercolor like this one, scan it into your computer, and you can um, add all kinds of different effects to it after you've painted it. So you can do have an original painting and then throw it into the computer and do the rest of the painting um, digitally. And then that way, too, you get a, more of a feeling of traditional paint. I mean, I've seen some people do... Um, digital paintings, but you wouldn't be able to tell unless they told you themselves that, oh, no, 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 I did that as a digital painting. This is not um, a traditional, it's a digital. Um, 
you can't tell the difference because the way the brushes are designed nowadays, the way you can do different kinds of special effects nowadays, um, a lot of uh, digital paintings will look just like um, a traditionally done pen and ink, traditionally done watercolor, traditionally done oil painting, and it is very difficult to tell the difference unless you've been a painter yourself. Um, most of the time I can tell the difference between a digital and a, a traditional, uh, primarily because the brush strokes are um, very even or the, the type of brush they've used. Um, it doesn't have as much variety or variance that you can get out of um, a traditional medium. Um, so it's really nice if you can do both. If you can, you know, you start it in, a lot of times I'll start um, drawings in um, traditional and I'll scan them into the computer and then I, w I can um, uh, clean them up in the computer or do a different type of technique in the computer. Um, I personally like doing watercolor. It's, it's been one of my favorite mediums since Geez, um, I learned, first learned to really use watercolor when I was about 10 years old. So I have been painting in watercolor for quite some time. I'd say about, that would be, ooh, what, 50 odd years? And then some that I've been painting in watercolor. So it's, it's a medium that I'm familiar with and I enjoy using and is comfortable for me because I have been using it for such a long time. So you can tell right now I've, I've been I'm using this little brush. This is um, basically a um, a number one to get this blue down. Now if I'd wanted to use um, get it down faster, I could have used a bigger brush and probably had as much um, control um, depending on the type of brush you're using. Okay, but that's that's the initial blue. I'm gonna I'm gonna be laying down um, another layer of blue on top of that one um, once it fully dries. Um, but we're gonna paint the dragon next. So I'm gonna give him. Let's see here. I'm gonna go with this is kind of a like a permanent green um, or a sap green. So it's, it's a bit of a, you know, or a hunter green. It's probably a sap green, basically. Sap or permanent green. So it's, it's um, green that leans to the yellow side. And then I'm going to throw a little bit. This is a, um, a cad yellow right here. And I'm going to throw... Now, mind you, I'm putting some green into that cad yellow because I'm not caring if it goes yellow. Um... This is more of a lemon yellow here. So this cat, this yellow here is more of an orangey yellow. It has a little bit of red in it. So it'll, um, it will dull the green down a bit um, because of the orange in it. And I'll probably use some red accents on our dragon too because um, with a, red compliments are always nice. Okay, so... That's a little bit too. I want to make him more green, green. It's like I want him to be... The problem is, is that you can tell there's a lot of heavy pigment in these two colors. And so they're going to um, basically cover up a lot of the detail work that I did in the dragon. So I'm going to start with this. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with some Prussian blue. Because... Um, Prussian blue and the, the yellowy color will give me a really nice minty green. So I'm going to start by just getting this yellow green in the uh, outer areas. And then I'm going to come in with a uh, more blue green. But. Uh, and you had to play with this a bit. Down here. We ran out of music. Let's see. And I have no idea why I ran out of music. It just disappeared on me. That's what's going on. Oh well. 
the music is not important as doing the, the, the painting, though it does, it's nice in the background while we're working. And uh, if you um, like what I'm doing here, I, I try to put up um, something either about drawing or painting or um, doing illustration um, every week um, because I, I do a lot of drawing and painting. I have a Patreon where um, I put up uh, lots of free downloads and um, this one will be up there as a, a download so that if you want a JPEG of it. Um, and come to the Patreon and get the JPEG of it. And I also have the, um, the original drawing as a coloring page. And while I'm painting these, I figure it's like, since I'm, I'm painting things anyways, I might as well talk about what I'm painting while I'm painting it. So that if you're interested in knowing how somebody does a watercolor, how it works, what is, what's the difference between doing a watercolor and say using magic marker and I thought you know hey I'm doing the paintings anyways maybe you'd like to see how I get them done and this one one of the reasons why I'm doing this particular piece today is um, while I'm doing this you'll probably be getting this on a Thursday but I wanted my patrons to have something for uh, December 31st this is the let right now it's the last um, day of 2023. It's been a tough year for me. I don't know what this year's been like for you, but uh, it was a very difficult year for me. Um, my work in animation, the, uh, the um, actors went on strike. The um, management used that as an excuse to not do anything um, because they get paid no matter, you know, whether they've got something in production or not a lot of the times or they can say well we can't produce anything right now because of all of our actors are on strike but actually in animation um, all the actors actually um, the voice actors are under they aren't under SAG they're under um, a different auspices I can't remember what their particular guild is but um, I believe most voice actors are not covered under SAG I know that um, most animation writers end up being script writers for other things as well. So even though they um, aren't covered under the Writers Guild for animation, they're actually covered under the Animation Guild for animation writing. Um, they basically, I think, were, were um, um, trying to uh, support the Writers Guild strike as well as um, basically because the the you know production companies were not producing anything you know they couldn't um you know you can't write when there's no shows in production and so a lot of um writers and uh, artists and actors have been out of work the past year because of the writer's strike and we needed it too if you don't know anything about artificial intelligence there's a good possibility that it's going to change everything when it comes to um, how we produce cartoons in the future. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm, I'll get back to that, but um, I'm going to, I'm using some alizarin crimson for my shadows under the wings. I'm putting, this is a, a pinky red that I want to stain as the shadows under the wings. So I'm just kind of, this is wet into wet. That's how we're getting this, this nice, foxing and blending is right now the the um, the paint in the veins on his wings is still wet so I'm putting that that nice um, alizarin crimson which again is a pink red and I'm using that in the shading of the uh, the area under his wings right now and I think I'm gonna put a little purple in there too um, I'll put a little bit more blue in there. Um, we'll see. Once I get this alizarin crimson in there, I kind of like the, the red and the green. And what I might do too is then put some more green over that pink, um, which will also um, give you an interesting color. And that's the thing. When you start using watercolor and you start layering some of these colors, 
you get unusual um, colors being produced by the transparency of one color over another. And whereas this alizarin crimson is um, a pinky red over the green, you can see I'm, I'm starting to get some interesting browns and it's also standing out as a pink on the, um, the burnt sienna that we laid down in the first place. Okay. I want to take that leg, make that leg a little bit more in the background. And I'm going to take the background now. Now that we got our dragon pretty much done there, I'm going to take um, some Prussian blue. Put a little Prussian blue here. And I am going to go over these nice swirlies in the background with Prussian blue. And I think what I'm going to do when I get done is I'm going to add some purple to that background too. And while I'm doing this, I think I'm going to, I'm going to blot it up too. I'm going to lay it down. So I'm just going to, you know, scumble over the top of this. Actually, that looks pretty good. All right. And then I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm going to blot it. And that's going to give me some variance in the tone. And it's going to keep it to the lighter side. So I get a variety of the tone that's going down there. And... It doesn't get too dark. And then what I might do, I'm either going to go in and I'm going to make um, probably the corner from the top right down to the bottom left a little darker. So I'll go back in with some more either blue or purple towards the end of this painting. We're, we're starting to get towards the end of it right now. You can see everything is more or less filled in. So we're getting towards the, the detailing up part. Right now I'm going to fill it, finish filling up all the background. So it's like I don't want any of these swirlies. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to hit the, hit the light again. Um, it's funny. It's like the uh, my camera that I have when it's for on Steadicam, it's really picky about where you place the camera. You can't zoom in with the camera itself you have to place it a certain level above the um, image that I'm painting and so it's re actually relatively close to the painting right now okay that's good and you'll note when I'm using primarily this is the Prussian blue that I'm using it's a Prussian or Windsor blue which is a it's a turquoise it's a blue green so we started out with more of a purpley blue in the background and then we're going with the uh, the Prussian blue over the top and these are uh, a lot of these color choices are kind of color choices in the moment I just wanted uh, green dragon I liked green dragons he's kind of a yellow green green dragon but he's got a lot of um, you know red brown accents and then when I get done with this entire painting, um, I'm going to let it dry. And then I'll go in with um, the pen one more time. And I will crisp up the outline. And I will crisp up the details with um, pen again. This, is, this particular drawing was done with uh, a Micron um, um, what was it? Pigma. Pen, which is basically um, kind of a replacement for rapidograph pens. It's got pigment in it so it, it won't fade and it's very much like um, traditional India ink um, so over time it will last. Okay. Right, so we've got you know we've got this nice modeled background and different color and quality and I'm thinking we want to keep it like dark maybe down here 
up to his wing. I was thinking getting it dark here, going that way, but I'm thinking down here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little bit of the alizarin crimson and I'm going to mix it in with my blue here. So I'm getting a purple. You can see the purple over there. And I'm going to mix in some of my cobalt. And then I'm going to mix in even a little bit of the turquoise. Now I'm not mixing it. You can tell I'm not getting really heavy with the mixing. I'm getting so there's kind of puddles of the different colors. Just um, My main um, goal here is to get it dark and to get it in a more purple range. So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to start down this corner. And some more lizard and crimson. I want a little bit more red. So I'm going to start down this corner. And I'm going to work it up. Because I want this to, it to be a bit darker down here. Now it's going to dry a lot lighter than that. Purples go pretty dark, pretty fast. Just warning you, if you're using purple in any painting, um, they take things dark pretty fast. Um, so you got to be careful when you're painting with purple. It's it's almost you almost want to think of purple like it's it's a black or gray, because it will it will darken up your painting. And depending on the purple that you use, um, or the violet you use, um, it will darken up things very quickly. And you may um, not like what it, the, the darkness that turns out. Um, if something gets too dark, you can always um, come back with water. And you'll have to try it a couple of times because... Um, you may make a mistake one or two times um, where it's not coming out the way you want when you come back in with water to lighten up something. Um, but I have taken whole paintings where I have put them under a, um, a faucet and washed off the entire painting of what I've done. And it's amazing how the stain of the paint that you left behind, it comes out to be what you wanted in the first place. Um, that, that can be some cra is a crazy kind of experimentation, but that's why it's also really good to, if you've never done a lot of watercolors, I always recommend work small. I mean, this, this particular piece we're working on right here is four by six inches. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why I like, I like working small, um, for one reason that we'll have this done in less than an hour, um, and you can do, you can make mistakes and fix them in a short order. Now I'm going to put some more Lewisur and Crimson in here. And I'm going to make it follow this edge here while it's wet because I want some foxing. I want a little bit of that blending in where it shouldn't be. So I'm, this is wet at the present. I want a little bit more lizard and crimson in there. A little want it to be purple more to the red side. So I'm putting it in right now. And I'm also kind of giving that, that shape, the funny shapes that I put in there that, that look kind of like smoke. I want them to stand out a little bit. And when these colors mix together, um, You'll get some more interesting, I'm putting a little bit of cobalt in here with the alizarin, and that will mix together in some interesting foxing, and it'll go darker that way. And I want this area right here to be a little bit darker. I want to give a little bit of volume to the painting by not keeping the, the value of the background the same. And so I'm trying to pull this, this area in this corner down a bit, um, because I want to give a feeling of volume in the painting itself by um, having one corner darker and the other corner lighter. So that's why I'm pulling some darker values in there. And we'll see what happens um, when it dries. Again, I, like I said, this looks very dark right now, but watercolor really does have a tendency to lighten up when it dries. So. It's, you've got to get used to that feeling of, okay, sorry about that. Um, you got to get that feeling of how um, the paint is going to dry for you, how 
how light is it going to get, how dark is it going to stay. Um, and sometimes you have to let it dry and then go over it again when there's an area that you want really dark and it's just not getting to be the way you want it to be. I want that to come back a little bit more, so I'm going to paint over it there. And again, I like to use um, a bit of stippling to give um, more texture and more volume. And sometimes that, that, that stippling just totally disappears when it dries. And you intended one thing and you'll get another. And you can always adjust things after it dries. Um, they may not be exactly the, the way you intended. I mean, few paintings rarely came, come out exactly the way you intend them to come out. Um, often they will come out in ways you never expected. Uh, and sometimes it's for the better, and sometimes it's not. And um, it's just trying to fix the mistakes and make them look like they were intentional. The things that you're doing are more intentional than, than accidental. And with a lot of watercolor, it's a lot of the things you do are accidental. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of Elizabeth and Crimson, and I'm going to put it um, in the shadow here again. We did that before, but I'm going to add a little bit more. And that also gives a little bit more har harmony. Okay. And then the one last thing I'm going to do is this tongue here. And then I'm going to take a little bit of just water and see where there are areas where we have just a little bit of um, where the, the paint just kind of didn't quite... Um, meet the edges. I can I can also come in with um, pen and get those little specks of white that you know when the the paint goes away it, it kind of um, disappears a bit but for now I'm going to uh, just paint in put a little bit of lizard and crimson on his tail here. Um, I think the, the, this is just about done. Um, I only used my I only used my number one brush on this one. I didn't come in with the zero. It's kind of like last time I was going to use my my blue pencil and I only used my two B. Um, best laid plans of mice and men. But I think we've we've got our dragon there. Um, let's see here. Let's I'm going to put a little bit more out here. Let's see. because I'm trying to like get this color out a little bit more here as well. So we've, we've got like a, a, a full like diagonal across there to, to pull your eye. Now, like I said, when this fully dries, um, some of that may disappear. Some of that, you know, like we have this heavy blue here, that heavy blue dot may disappear. Um, I'm gonna put a little bit more. Right here, we have this blue area that's not fully filling in there. And I think that's about it. And there's our little painted dragon. And I hope you enjoyed my little lecture on how to do some basic watercolor. And have an amazing day. Thank you for stopping by. My name is Lynn Hunter again. Um, please join my Patreon. It's, um, you can join it for $12 a year. Um, at the lowest level and I put up a lot of JPEGs and puzzles and fun games and coloring stuff and uh, um, I do at least one video a week and I try to put up um, at least between three to seven postings a week. So thank you for stopping by again and I'll see you next time.